Sunrise and sunset. Promise and fulfillment. Birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Time and distance are closely related, and one is often measured by the other. For instance, the distance to the stars is not measured in miles, but in so many light years. The mileage between, let us say, New York and Cairo is not measured in miles alone in this modern age, but also in flying hours. A commuter on his way to the station looks not only at his car speedometer in an anxious way, but also at his wristwatch. The course of a man's life itself is calculated in minutes and hours, and whether that distance is great or small depends on the timekeeper, his conscience. Ah. Ah. That was quite a meal. I'm glad you liked it, Fletcher. Avocado, boiled lobster, crepe suzettes. And a good wine to top it off. Could a man ask for more? <laughs> Hardly. Here, Wilton, have a cigar. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing like a good meal to make a man feel at peace with the world and <laughs> to give him an urge to talk. <laughs> good conversation is the final course for a perfect dinner. Let me tell you a little story, Wilson. You've, you've got some time, haven't you? Mm. This will be worth your while. You know, this isn't the only first-rate meal I've ever had. There was a time once when caviar and lobster were on my menu every day. Mm, is that so? The world was my oyster, Wilson, and I was salting it to my taste. <laughs> of course, it didn't begin that way. You used to be a valet, didn't you? That's right. I worked as somebody's boot polisher for over seven years. He was a wealthy man, a multimillionaire. Oh, uh, have some wine, Wilson? Um, no, thanks. Yes, I worked like the proverbial horse for Gregory Richards, and I found that he didn't appreciate my merits. It was rather disappointing, to say the least. But I am a man of some ingenuity. I waited for my chance, and when it came, I was ready for it. The servants have all been dismissed, Mr. Richards. All right, Fletcher. Has Mrs. Richards come in? Uh, just a moment ago, sir. I told her that you were in the library. Has she noticed anything? Not that I know of, sir. That'll be all, Fletcher. You mean, uh, for now, Mr. Richards? I mean, you're going, too, with the rest of them. Oh, I, I, I see, sir. Oh, sorry I have to do it this way, but we're closing the house. You've been a good valet, Fletcher. I hate to lose you. But I have no other choice. If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Richards, isn't this dismissal rather abrupt after so many years of service? I'm giving you a month's pay in advance. That's fair enough. I don't quite see it that way, sir. What do you mean, you don't quite see it? I have been a little more to you than... Just a valet. Have you? I might say I have been your, uh, confidant. Just what are you getting at? It seems to me that a small, uh, a pension of perhaps $5,000 would repay me for my service. Oh, really? You must admit that I've been discreet, very discreet. Are you trying to blackmail me? If your affair with Miss Cartwright had been entrusted to less capable hands than mine... All right, Fletcher, get out. <laughs> Mr. Richard, Get out before I break your filthy neck. Very well. But, Mr. Richards, you may have reason one day to regret this. Goodbye, sir. Charles! Lucy! Fletcher! Where is everybody? Gregory! Gregory! Uh, what is it, dear? What's going on in this house? Where are the servants? They're gone, Harriet. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Where's Fletcher? He's gone, too. I dismissed them all. Gregory, have you gone crazy? On the contrary, I've made up my mind to a very difficult decision. Have you? I'm sick of this house, Harriet, and everything it stands for. I've made arrangements with a broker to sell it. Without consulting me? I have no reason to consult you about anything any longer. The plain fact is that I'm leaving you, Harriet, for good. Well, so you've come up with it at last. I'm glad you knew it was coming. I'm glad you realize we can't go on this way. It makes it easier. What do you think I am, an old pair of shoes? Do you really believe you can dismiss me like the servants and get away with it? I'll provide you with money. Money? And what about my pride? Do you think I want to face my friends after you've thrown me over for that woman? Then you know. Yes, I know. I've known for a long time. You think you'll get a divorce from me. 
Well, it'll be over my dead body. Harriet. Anne Cartwright, the darling of polite society. Anne Cartwright, the champ. Harriet, I will. I'll ruin you. her. That's what I'll do. I'll splash this thing over every tabloid in the country. And I'll ruin you, too. I'll show you up to your fancy friends and what you are. You wait and see. Why? Why would you? You never loved me. I gave you everything money could buy. Why don't you give me my freedom now when it means nothing to you? Because I hate you, that's why. And I hate her. Oh, I know what her family's like. They won't allow you to get within ten feet of her as long as you're married. You think you can make a fool of me, Gregory? Well, you'd better think twice. So this is how you want it to be? Just wait until I really get started. I'll show you how I want it to be. She won't be able to show her face again. You wouldn't dare. She'll want to run away. And find a hole to hide it. Harriet! The trap! The duck! <laughs> oh, no, you won't get away with that, Harriet! I told you. Harriet. Harriet, get up. Harriet! He's dead. I've got to do something. But where? How? Oh. I've got it. Yes, the cellar. The cellar. Underneath the cement. <laughs> In the morning, they'll never know. Do you need any help, <laughs> sir? You've done a pretty good job, a very good job, Mr. Richards. May I suggest that a layer of cement over that tomorrow will hide it forever? I thought you'd gone. Oh, no, Mr. Richards, I'm still here, as you see. Fetcher! Don't play your hand on me, Mr. Richards, not unless you want to face this kitchen knife. All right, Fetcher, you win. Call the police. The police? Go on, turn me in. Oh, 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 Mr. Richards, as I told you once before, you... Uh, Underestimate my value, why call the police? What do you mean? The police would do neither of us any good. How much do you want? <laughs> now, really, Mr. Richards. Ten thousand? Twenty? A bargain's a bargain. Name your price. You may find it rather high. But then, your life is worth something, too, Mr. Richards. What is it? <laughs> For heaven's sake, don't stand there grinning like an idiot. What do you want to keep quiet? Everything, Mr. Richards. Everything. Sit down, Fletcher. Thank you. Not there. That's my chair. I know it. Now, look. You've got a price. I want to know how much you want. Do you mind if I have one of your cigars? Thank you. Of all the... Maybe you don't quite understand the situation you're in, Mr. Richards. Your life is in the palm of my hand. If I pick up that phone, I can put a noose around your neck so fast you wouldn't know what hit you. What are you trying to do? Torture me? Are you just playing with me to amuse yourself before you turn me in? I have no intention of turning you in, providing, of course, we come to terms. What are your terms? I've asked a dozen times. And I've told you. Everything. I'm going to live the way you live and enjoy what you enjoy. For the rest of your natural life. Make that a little clearer. Yes, I suppose I must. From now on, I'll be the fine gentleman, Mr. Richards. From now on, I'll see what it's like to live in Velvet. Oh, but of course, you live here with me. That's decent of you. Yes, and what's more, you'll wait on me the way I waited on you, do you hear? You'll be the valet, Mr. Richards, and I'll be the master. You're mad. Not entirely, no. However, I am a generous man. I won't confine you to the house. You may leave occasionally, providing you let me know where you're going. I don't mind. That's very big of you. And there'd be no point in your running away, either. I'd have the police on your neck in a hurry if you did. And besides... Miss Cartwright would also be involved. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Gregory, dear, did I keep you waiting? Uh, sit down, Anne, please. Have you ordered? No, no, I can't stay for lunch. I have another appointment. But it's been so long since we've seen each other. What is it, Gregory? Why are you worried? Did you tell your wife? Yes, I told her. And she refused to give you a divorce? Well, we were expecting that. She didn't we... refuse, Anne. No. As a matter of fact, she's in Reno right now. Oh, Gregory, then she understood. Perfectly. Oh, Gregory, if you're ashamed of what we've done, you needn't be. And I have something else to tell you. What is it? For a while, I mean, until this blows over, we mustn't see each other. Mustn't see each other? But why? We've nothing to hide anymore. I insist on it, Anne. It's the only way. How long do you think that will be? I couldn't say. A few months, maybe. Gregory... We've no other choice, don't you see? 
We've got to give this some dignity. We've got to protect ourselves from gossip. Gossip doesn't worry me. I've already told my father and mother the situation. You have? Yes, I have. I told them I'm not afraid of scandal, and, and I love you. I gave them a choice. They either see it my way, or I leave the house. You mean that? Of course I do, dear. And I thought Harriet would ruin them. Gregory. This is a fine time to find out. Darling, you look so tired. I am tired. You need a rest. Why not go away for a week or two? No. Bermuda, perhaps, it'll do you good. No, I can't go away. I can't leave town. Don't ask me to. It's only a suggestion. And I've got to leave you now. So soon? Yes, I must. Gregory, what's wrong? I'm afraid, Anne. Afraid of what? Something I can't explain. Surely you can tell me. No, I can't tell anyone, not even you. Gregory, look at me. There's nothing, my darling, that can't be wiped out and forgotten. Wiped out? That's it, Anne. That's the only way. I've thought about it and tried to plan it, but somehow my thoughts were never clear. You've clarified them for me completely. Where are you going, Gregory? What are you going to do? I'm going to erase this problem from my life forever. Once the cake is cut, the saying goes, it is simple to enjoy another piece. Once the timekeeper loses track of the seconds in your mind, the clock runs wild. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And what does it profit the killer to take a human life and lose his own in return? Yes, what is it? Fletcher? Come in, Richards. I thought I told you to call me Mr. Fletcher when you address me, Richards. Do you have the check? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ten thousand. Fine, you may go now. You may even take the afternoon off, my good fellow. I have something else here besides the check, Mr. Fletcher. <laughs> so I see. There are six bullets in this gun. I'm going to fill your rotten body with them. And what do you propose to do with me? Put me in the cellar next to your wife? Exactly. I don't know why I never did this before. It's so easy, it makes me laugh. Richard, you're a fool. Am I? Put the gun down. If you kill me, you die too. You whip me long enough, Fletcher. The party's over. You idiot. Don't you think I'm prepared for this? Do you consider me to be so childish I let you get away with so simple a trick? What, what, what do you mean you're prepared for it? There's a note in my bank vault to be opened at my death. That note gives complete directions as to where the late Mrs. Richards can be found. And how she got there. No. You didn't. Put the gun on top of my desk, Richards, before you make me lose my temper. <laughs> and that would be inconvenient for both of us. That's better. You've worked it out completely, haven't you? To the last detail. Clever, wasn't it? Incidentally, you met Anne Cartwright for luncheon this afternoon. You followed me? She's very pretty. Oh, yes, extremely attractive and young. A man could learn to appreciate a woman like that. I wonder how attractive I'd be to her. I'd like you to invite her here, Richards, for dinner. I want to know more about her. I have a feeling that we could become very good friends. Just what are you driving at? I told you I wanted everything, and everything includes Miss Cartwright. Extend the invitation, Richards, for tomorrow night. Why, you... Richards! <laughs> Mind your manners. Tell Miss Cartwright she'll be having dinner with me at eight tomorrow evening, and Richards, that dinner will be for two. Good evening, Fletcher. Good evening. May I take your things? Thank you. Will you tell Mr. Richards I'm here? He's not in at the moment. He isn't? No, he suggested that uh, I entertain you for a while. You? Will you have a whiskey and soda? No, thank you. You don't mind if I have one, do you? Fletcher, have you been drinking? Oh, well, I've had three or four, just enough to make my conversation interesting. Please tell Mr. Richards to call me when he arrives. Are you leaving? Yes, I am. You're very impulsive, Anne. I was looking forward to an enjoyable evening. I even prepared the dinner myself. Fletcher, do you realize that Mr. Richards will dismiss you for this? Dismiss me? 
<laughs> Dismiss me. <laughs> oh, that's very good. <laughs> Mr. Richard's dismissing days are over. From now on, he's taking orders, not giving them. You're not only <laughs> drunk, you're crazy. Am I? Then, why has he changed so much in the past few weeks? Why does he crawl around like a worm, afraid of his own shadow? And why haven't you seen him as much as you used to? You know about that? <laughs> yes, my dear, I do. You see, I've taken over for Mr. Richards. His very life depends on me. Oh, you're lying. Why should I? What good would lying do me? Fletcher, just what did you mean when you said that... that his life depends on you? Oh, it's nothing to bother your pretty head about. Suffice to say that I'm the man worth knowing now. I can do as much for you as he ever could, and more. Fletcher, answer me. What did you mean? Oh, well, it has something to do with money. He's, uh, he's in a difficult spot, and I've taken over all his financial responsibilities. Now I know you're out of your mind. What would a valet know about finance? A valet, am I? I'm a great deal better than that, Anne, I assure you. I demand to know where Mr. Richard is. He's gone. Gone? Yes, he's uh, run away. He's not coming back. Oh, you expect me to believe that? No, I don't. And that's why he left this note. What note? Here. Well, let me read it to you. Dearest Anne, I'm going away for good. You won't see me again, so forget about me. <clears throat> Fletcher, my trusted friend, has taken over my estate... I can't explain why or how, just trust in him completely. And it's signed Gregory. Let me see that. There you are. You ought to recognize his handwriting by this time. Dearest Anne. But why did he go? What have you to do with this? You love him, don't you? Well, I... If you love him, you'll be nice to me. The truth of the matter is that your Gregory is an embezzler, and I'm protecting him from the police. Oh, that can't be true. But it is. My darling. Oh, oh, take your hands off me. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. Now, aren't you being a little... <laughs> I can't out of my way. You'll come back. And when you do, you'll make up for that slap. Dearest Anne... <laughs> Dictators are always small men, either in physical size or in moral stature. The one thing they cannot fight is time. It cuts them all down to the same size sooner or later. Listen as the clock moves on. Who's there? What? Oh, it's, it's you, Richard. Yes, it's I. I told you to get out of town and stay out. Where's Anne? She's gone. But she'll be back. Now get out of here before I lose my patience. I've given you back your life and freedom, haven't I? Get out of my sight and stay out! Yes. You've given me my life and taken everything else. And what you've taken, Fletcher, is more valuable to me than what you've returned. Do you want me to call the police and turn you in? You needn't bother. I'll do it myself. What? I don't care what happens to me anymore, Fletcher. My life's finished. But at least I'll have the satisfaction of seeing you punished along with me. Punished? For what? I haven't done anything. You've been an accessory to the crime. You've helped me keep my secret. That's enough to get you 20 years. You're bluffing. You wouldn't dare to turn yourself in. The bluff's over, Fletcher. For both of us. Put it down. This gun of yours still holds six bullets, Richards. Drop that phone. You're through, Fletcher. <laughs> True, am I? We'll see about that. You've forgotten that there's still plenty of room in the cellar. For you? Just a moment. I'm coming. Well? 
Uh, Mr. Richards? Uh, Mr. Richards isn't in right now. My name is Fletcher. I'm handling his affairs. Oh, I see. Well, what do you want? Uh, well, I see you haven't moved the furniture out yet. Moved the furniture out? What are you talking about? Well, according to the contract, Mr. Richards is due to vacate by the 10th. That's today. Vacate? We're not moving. But this house has been sold, Mr. Sold? When? To whom? Well, Mr. Richards instructed his broker to sell a few weeks ago. The deal's been completed. Uh, no, no. The... Now, wait a minute. There, there, there's been some mistake. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the authorization to take over the premises. Oh. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Richards has changed his mind. He, he doesn't want to sell. The house has already been sold, mister. I told you that. Then we'll buy it back and we'll give them a profit on the transaction. They'll sell it back to us. Well, uh, well, maybe. Uh, in any case, Mr. Richards is the one to decide that. What? Well, the house was in his name. He's the only one who can change the deal. Well, where is Richards? Maybe if he sent a wire, he... Uh, he, uh, he can't be reached. No? No. Then we'll have to go ahead, mister. Now, wait a minute. This is ridiculous. Look, mister, I didn't make the deal about the house. It was made with the Sanley Realty Corporation. But don't you work for them? No, and, and if you don't mind a little tip, you haven't got a chance in the world of buying back this place. Why do you say that? Well, the Realty Corporation's going to erect a $50 million office building, and this site is part of the layout. So don't waste your time by trying to make any deals with them. Well, if you don't work for them, who do you work for? I'm an agent for the Franklin House Wrecking Company. We've got a contract to tear this place down and make room for the office building. You're, you're going to tear it down? So you better get somebody to move your stuff out, mister. My contract calls for us to begin work today. That's right now. I've got 40 men outside and we pay them by the hour. We can't wait. Hey, Joe! Yeah. Send the boys in, will you? We'll start, uh, well, well, I think we'd better check to see how deep the foundations are first. And we'll start by tearing up the cellar. Well, Wilson, what do you think? <laughs> Funny how it turned out for you. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't my fault. No. Oh, it was Richard who made the mistake, the fool. After killing his wife and being taken over by someone as smart as me, he just couldn't think straight. He'd completely forgotten that he'd turned the house over to a broker when he made up his mind to leave his wife. I guess you wouldn't have forgotten about it if you were running the show. I should say I wouldn't. The idiot. If he had only told me... If he'd only mentioned something, I... <laughs> well, that's how it goes. It's the fools who are responsible for all the trouble in this world. <sighs> well, thanks for the dinner, Wilson. I appreciated it. It was certainly one of the best I've ever had. Oh, don't thank me, Fletcher. It's on the state. A condemned man always gets the best. <laughs> time and distance are closely related, and one is often measured by the other. Scientists now measure the distance to the moon in rocket hours, and one day the men of the future may enable you to calculate the mileage around the world aboard your airliner in so many minutes. But one thing will always remain constant. The distance between the prison cell and the death house will always be measured by my ticking as I look down from the wall. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and starred Hart McGuire as the clock. Fletcher was played by Leonard Teal. As Richards, you heard Kevin Brennan. As Anne, Barbara Brunton. Gordon Glenwright was the guard. And as Harriet Richards and the agent, Sheila Sewell and Ken Hannum. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. story of
of Adam and Eve goes back in time to the very beginning of time. And it's a tale that keeps repeating itself throughout the centuries. Man dependent upon woman and woman dependent upon man, with each unable to do without the other. Perhaps that's what pretty Doris Neville was thinking of as she stood on the foredeck of the Hawaiian Queen just before it set sail from San Francisco bound for Honolulu. At least, she should have been thinking about it. For if she had, she might have avoided a great deal of trouble. The steward, are we on our way? Yes, ma'am. Tracy! Tracy Whitman! What are you doing on board this boat? Oh, I had to see you, honey. I had to see you. Don't you, to. honey, me. You followed me here. I'll have you put off. That's what I'll do. I'll call the captain. But I work on this boat, Doris. I, I got a job as a steward to Honolulu and back. Tracy, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You had no right to follow me. I told you our engagement was broken, and I meant it. Oh, Doris, give me a break. I'm crazy about you. You're lady and you're a loafer, Tracy. I won't have anything to do with a man who has no ambition. No ambition? I want to marry you, don't I? I want to raise a family, don't I? Isn't that ambition enough? Tracy, I want my husband to make himself useful in this world. I don't care if he's a banker or a plumber, as long as he works for a living. Well, I'm working now, aren't I, Doris? I got a job as a steward. Only because the passenger list was probably full and you had no other way of getting on the boat and pestering me to death. Oh, Doris, baby, listen to me. Listen the to me, will you? The stewards are not supposed to get fresh with passengers. I'm not getting fresh, Doris. I'm proposing. Proposing? Well, you'd better save your breath. Oh, Doris. I wouldn't marry you if, if you were the only man in the world I could marry. And that's final. Some moon, huh? Huh? Tracy, will you stop creeping up behind me that way? Well, I, I, I got a couple of hours off duty and I saw you standing here on deck alone and... Tracy, I want you to stop bothering me. You... You really mean that, don't you? Yes. I won't marry you now or ever. Well, I... I guess I know when I'm late. You ought to by this time, Tracy. You've been asking me ever since we left San Francisco four days ago. And once and for all, my answer is no. Okay, okay. You've made your choice. Now run back to your work like a good little boy and... Tracy, what are you doing? I don't know. I... I think I'll swim back to San Francisco. Tracy, get off that rail. Nothing matters anymore, I guess, and you don't care what happens now to me. Now, stop acting like a little boy and trying to scare me. Get off that rail before you fall overboard. You wouldn't miss me. Give me your hand and come down before you fall in. Ah, then you do care. Oh, honey, I knew you would. <laughs> Tracy, you're slipping. Let go of my oh, hand. Tracy. Help, help. Oh, oh, Wake up! Uh, 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 well, what happened? You and your tricks. You pulled me overboard when you slipped off that rail. Overboard? Oh. Where are we, Doris? I don't know. I only woke up a few minutes before you did. I, I remember landing here on the beach last night. You were unconscious. But then I passed out myself. It's only a miracle that we're alive. Wow. It's uh, really not so bad. What? What do you mean? I don't mind being alone on a desert island with you. Oh, well, well, we're not alone and this isn't a desert island. Uh, no? There are two women coming over that hill, and as soon as they show me where I can get some dry clothes, I'm taking the next boat. Uh, what? Those women. What about them, Dora? Holy smoke, they... They're carrying guns. Tracy, I don't like their looks. Just let me handle this, Doris. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, hello. Vera, look. Well, I, I can hardly believe it. Uh, something wrong with me? Oh, it's true, Vera. It really is true. Uh, say, uh, what, what's the uh, matter? Vera, what, would uh... you tell us where we are? We fell off our ship last night, and we're wet and we're hungry. Can you help us in some way? Yes, get up. I, I... Get up and be quiet. Oh. Angela. Gentlemen, to his feet. Why, why, thanks. Thank you, but how I can manage, oh, really. Oh, do be I... careful. Now, both of you will come with us. Where are we going? Never mind the questions. You'll find out. And listen, don't try to run away. Either of you. 
I'm the best shot on the island. You won't get far. Take them to the car, Angela, and let's get going. Oh. Oh. Casey. I'm scared. Oh, there's nothing to be scared of. What kind of a place is this? Who are these women? Search me, Doris. Look, hmm? we're coming into a town. Oh. And the place is alive with people. Oh. There's nothing to be frightened about. Yes, but don't you notice something odd, Tracy? Odd? Well, there are plenty of people here. But they're all women. Say that. Th that's right. There isn't a man in sight, Tracy. Oh, look, even the traffic policeman's a woman. Well, where do you think the men are? I... Tracy... I'm beginning to think there aren't any men. No men. But, but, Doris, that's crazy. Tracy, have you ever heard of the Amazons? Sure, sure. A bunch of women live in the jungle and they killed every man they found. Tracy. Oh, but, but, but these women aren't Amazons, Doris. They're civilized. They look just like the girls back home. Yes, sir. Just like the girls back home. Wait. Let me ask the driver. Uh... uh uh, excuse me, lady. Yes? Uh, where are the men in this town? You know, is there a ball game on or something? Oh, there hasn't been a man on Waco Island for, for 20 years. And, mister, you're a sight for sore eyes. Where are you taking us now? At least you can tell us that. Well, we're taking you to Queen Hermina. She rules the island. And then what? Oh, you've got nothing to worry about. Blue eyes. Oh, the queen will be tickled pink to see you. And how? And what about me? You? <laughs> Kid, you're just excess baggage. You'll probably go back where you came from. You'll get a welcome, too. <laughs> from the shark. The queen will see you inside. Tracy's arrival's already been announced. Doris will stay here until she's called for. Tracy. Don't worry about it, honey. It'll be all right. Keep an eye on her, Vera. Leave it to me. Come on. Blue eyes. I brought the, uh, the man, Your Highness. So I see. Where's the girl? Outside. Keep her there until I call. You may go. As you wish, Your Majesty. Oh. Well. <laughs> Well, you needn't feel ill at ease with me. There's nothing to be afraid of. What's your name? Whitman. Tracy Whitman. Tracy. Oh, that's a lovely name. And my girlfriend's name is Doris. I'm we... not interested in your girlfriend. Sit down and, and relax. Thanks. I suppose your mind is full of questions about our island and our people. Well, it, it is kind of funny. I, I, I mean, know see, exactly I... what you mean, and I'll try to explain as briefly as possible. As you undoubtedly know already, this island is inhabited exclusively by women. That is, until you arrive. That's what they told us. The people who originally founded this island, the mothers and fathers of the women who inhabit it now, came here to build a new life for themselves and a new civilization. There were too many wars in the old one, and they decided to shift for themselves. Well, they, they did pretty good. They did wonders, Tracy. We manufacture everything we need on this island, and we have almost everything you'll find in the rest of the world. Waco Island is uncharted, and we're completely cut off from the mainland. But there's one thing we lack, and we found it's the most important. Oh? Huh? What's that? Men. But, uh, uh, what happened to the men who, uh, who founded the place? Oh, they died along with the women. And all the children who were left were girls. No boys? No boys. Well, that's... That's a peculiar situation. Tracy, you're the first man who's set foot here in over 20 years. And that calls for a public holiday. Well, well, thanks. I, I appreciate the honor. I shall decree three days of feasting... As a prelude to our wedding. A what? <laughs> our wedding, Tracy. You're going to marry me. I'm queen and absolute ruler here. You shall be my king. But I'd rather go home on the next boat. You what? 
I, I don't mean any offense, you may. There are no I... boats. No boat could reach this island. The coral banks are treacherous. Besides, there's no reason for you to go back. I know we can make you happy. But there's Doris. Doris? My fiancée, she's outside, and she's the one I'm going to marry. Oh, indeed. Well, if Doris is your only worry, we'll fix her very quickly. Send the girl in. Yes, Your Majesty. Go in. Oh, oh Tracy. So, this is Doris. This is the Queen Hermina, honey. <laughs> Men uh, haven't changed after all. You offer them a kingdom and they prefer some washed-out blonde who hasn't the strength of a mouse. Don't you dare talk to me like that. Are you engaged to this man? No. That he said you were. Sure, sure we're engaged. She, she's just been spelling it all. Besides, I love her, Your Highness, more than anything else in the world. That's how you feel right now, but you'll change your mind. Not so long as I can see her and know she's near me. Tracy. We can fix that too. What? <laughs> Lieutenant. Yes, Your Majesty. Take the girl away. I don't want to lay eyes on her again. Do you understand? Perfectly. Come on. Let go of me. You'd better come quietly now. Let go of my arm. Hey, what's the idea? What are you going to do to her? <laughs> I'm just making it easier for both of us, darling. What do you mean? You said that as long as you can see her and know she's near, you'll keep on loving her. Well? I'm going to eliminate that minor problem... By having her executed in the morning. Oh, no. <laughs> Doris will be executed in the morning. Oh, no. No, you can't do that. <laughs> Why can't I? I'm the queen. My word is law. But you can't execute a girl for being engaged. I don't intend to. I'll find another charge. What other charge? Um, interfering with government assets. Attempting to steal state treasures. <laughs> you are a treasure, you know. If you put one finger on Doris, you'll never see me again. Tracy! Look, I'll, I'll make you a proposition. Yes? I'm supposed to be a valuable guy on this island, and you want me to marry you. Well, all right. Give Doris her freedom... And we'll get married tomorrow. Do you mean that, Tracy? You... You have my word for it. Then you've made a bargain. <laughs> Lieutenant, send the girl back in here immediately. Yes, Your Majesty. All right, you. In. Oh. Doris, I've decided to give you a reprieve. That's very kind of you. And to show how generous I really can be, I'll also give you a job in the palace. What can you do? I... I can type. Type? Oh, we've got millions of typists on this island. No, 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 that's no good. Uh, Your Majesty, uh, may I suggest, uh, why don't you make her a lady in waiting? Say, that might not be a bad idea. I'll think about it. Meanwhile, I have something more important with which to concern myself. Our wedding. Your... your wedding? Yes. Tracy and I are going to be married tomorrow. Married? It's the, the only way, Doris. I, I mean... It's... You needn't explain, Tracy. I... I understand. I understand all too well. You know, she she almost sounded as if she cared. Oh, she'll get over it. Everyone else on this island has done without a man. She'll get used to the idea. Um, haven't we forgotten something, Tracy? Oh? For what? When two people are betrothed, they usually seal the bargain with a kiss. Oh, yes, I, I think that's the accustomed formality. I'm waiting, darling. Oh, Tracy, my lord. Halt! Who goes there? Angela, to change the guard. Oh, it's about time you showed up. My feet are killing me. Where is he? Inside. The Queen's orders are that he's not to be disturbed. He's not to be allowed out of his room either until the wedding. The Queen's taking no chances. She's not so dumb. Oh, the Queen always gets the breaks. Oh. Oh, do you know what he did when I escorted him here? No? Reach! <gasps> for the sky! Oh, it's a fold-up, Vera. Oh. Not a move, understand? Where's the guy? Inside. You go into that room and the queen will hang you in the city's court. Shut up and open that door. Oh, open it, Angela. She means business. Ha! 
Hey, you! Me? Come out here! Hey, what's the matter? What are you doing with that gun? You're coming with me. And as for you two dames, tie them up, Ruby, and take their mouths shut so they can't yell. Okay. All right, big boy. Let's go. Say, what is this? Where are you taking me? Well, you're even better looking than I thought you'd be. Who are you? <laughs> who is she? <laughs> Say, what are you, a hermit? Ah, uh, he wouldn't know who I am, Ethel. He just got here. The lady on your right, Sonny, is Gladys Peach. The only dame in town who don't take orders from the queen. Yep. I'm the president of the Waco Protective Association. I protect people. <laughs> For a fee. You mean you're a racketeer? Ah. Uh. Now, that's not a nice word for a gent to use. Listen, mister. On the south side of town, my word is law. Queen Amina's guards patrol in threes down there. <laughs> when they patrol at all. What I want, I take. And nobody stands in my way. But, uh, what do you want with me? Are you kidding? Listen, lover boy. How would you like to be Mr. Gladys Keach? You mean, you want to marry me? Got any objections? Oh, I... I guess it doesn't make any difference anymore. It's it's all kind of funny, though. What is? A week ago, I was on my knees begging every girl to be my wife. Now I'm getting a proposal every 20 minutes. Oh, don't you worry about it, sweetheart. From now on, your bachelor days are over. Hear ye, hear ye. The abductors of Her Majesty's fiancé will not only be pardoned, but will be rewarded with a royal grant of 50,000 walkers if he is brought back unharmed by proclamation of the Queen. I tell you, Gladys, we're going too far. Look, I got him and I'm keeping him, period. But the mob's getting jumpy. 50,000 is 50,000. And the Queen is combing every inch of the town for us. Mm. So that's how it stands, huh? Oh, you can't blame them. Anyway, you could never get away with it. He'll be spotted in a minute wherever he goes. You can't hide out with him forever. Hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe you're right, Ethel. But listen, suppose I do take him back. Why should a nibs have the privilege of marrying him? Oh, I guess everybody would like that chance. Even me. What's the trouble? Look, boss, I've got an idea. Yeah? If you swing it on the queen and she okays it, maybe we'll all get an even break. It's a long shot, but but you'll have to admit it's fair. So? Listen to what I've got to say. Inside you, inside. Ah, take that gun out of my ribs, you debutante. You! I came up here in my own time and without a rod, I expect... But the little courtesy. And who is this? Gladys Keach, your majesty. Oh, the gangster who took my Tracy? Relax, queen, and get this dame out of here. I didn't have to come see, and you won't get nowhere by pushing me around. Leave us alone, Vera. Okay, your majesty. Where is he? Oh, he's safe. Don't worry about it. Bring him here, and I'll pay you well. You'll also receive complete amnesty, as I promised. Look, chum, I've got a little deal to make with you. And it's the only way you'll get him back. I see. What's your offer? We raffle him off. We what? We make it a national lottery. A sweepstake with Tracy as a prize. The lucky number gets the wedding bell. Oh, no. My mob won't stand for nothing else. And neither will your people. Do you want to start a revolution? If you do, you just try and keep him for yourself, sister. Oh, very well. I'll issue the proclamation today. Everyone will be given a number. Okay, Your Majesty, now you're talking. And may the best gal win. <laughs> Tracy, you all right? Oh, sure. They brought me back to the palace yesterday. What are you doing here, Doris? I bribed one of the guards to let me see you. Tracy, do you know what's going on? I hear they're raffling me off. Ten thousand women are going to pick numbers for you. Isn't it awful? Oh, it's not so bad. Tracy, do you still love me? You ought to know better than to ask. Would you come back to me if you had the chance? Say, you, 
You don't expect to win that lottery when the odds are 10,000 to one. Just answer my question, Tracy. Oh, Doris, there'll, there'll never be anyone else in the world. No one but you. Then what happens doesn't matter. As long as I know that. Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye, my darling. And keep your fingers crossed. For me. Silence! Silence! Her Majesty, the Queen! I will now draw the lucky number from this bowl. The woman who will become the bride of Tracy Whitman. Number one, five, five, seven. And the name? Doris Neville. Tracy. Doris, darling, you won. We're going to be married. You haven't got a minute to lose. Come on, we've got to get out of here. Well, I thought that we... Listen, Tracy, it's our only chance. The guards are asleep. I put sleeping pills in their drinks. And I've got a sailboat on the beach with three days' supply. Well, why take a chance like that? After all, if we can live here and, and have a... Oh, Tracy, that siren means they're searching for me. For heaven's sake, come on! I still think we made a mistake, Doris. We've been at sea two days. We can starve to death before we sight a steamer. It was the only way. But why? We'd have had a wedding that would have been stupendous. You won me fairly. Oh, Doris, what was there to run away from? Oh, Tracy. Tracy, look! A boat! Where? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, oh. There. hey! Oh, Tracy! Hey, there. Oh! You've seen us, Doris. Look, they're signaling. Thank heaven. Oh, Doris. Honey, I, I know you said you want to marry me, but I won't hold you for that. What do you mean? Simply because you won me in a lottery doesn't put you under any obligation, you know. I can prove that I love you if you want me to. But how? Just by telling you I didn't win you in any lottery. But, but tell us that number. 1557. Five, it was yours. Yes, Tracy. But every number in that bowl was 1557. Yes? I made sure of that before the lottery began. What? You... You mean you... I don't say any more, darling. Just kiss me. Like this. Oh, honey. And so we return once more to the original story, the original man and the original woman, Adam and Eve. And we find that even if the situation were reversed, if woman became the pursuer and man the pursued, the results would be the same. The clock will be heard again next week. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and starred Hart McGuire as the clock. As Tracy and Doris, you heard Rodney Jacobs and Wendy Playfair. Others were Muriel Steinbeck, Diana Davidson, Georgie Sterling, Fifi Banvard and Pat Martin. The Clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset. Promise and fulfillment. Birth and death. The whole drama of life is written... In the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Have you ever noticed how time has a sameness about itself? Each hour you receive in life is guaranteed to be of uniform quantity, although its quality depends to a large extent on you. The life we live has a sameness about it, too. Doing the same things every day may have its duller moments, but we are often compensated by the security it affords. And sometimes, 
When the monotony is broken, we give the world to have it back again. When Joe and Nora Spencer were married, they went to Niagara Falls like so many millions before them. Later, they bought a little five-room suburban house, and it looked exactly like the hundreds of other five-room suburban houses you see so often. As a matter of fact, life itself was a carbon copy to Joe and Nora Spencer, a carbon copy they believed in and were happy with, until they discovered that their life was destined to have a new and an original twist. Ten o'clock. I guess we'll hit the hay out tonight, Nora. Mm-hmm. Finished with the newspaper? Just about. Sure. Looks like we have a nice day tomorrow. Mostly sunny, it says, with moderate west to southwest winds. Mm. Oh, Jeff, did I tell you the hogs are coming over tomorrow night? Oh, you didn't have to tell me. Tomorrow's Monday, isn't it? Oh, that's right. Monday the hogs, Tuesday Bill Pepper and his wife, Wednesday the movie. <laughs> you make it sound like a routine. Well, it's a routine, more or less. Do you mind it? You know I don't. Sometimes I wonder if the life we lead is a little too dull for you. That's funny, I've thought of the same thing about you. I'm very happy, Joe. You know that. Oh, sure, I know. And I wouldn't want anything to change it. Nothing ever will. I wish I was sure of that. I wish I was sure that you and I and this house would go on forever, just as we are. Hey, what's got into you tonight? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'm so happy I'm just looking for trouble. Well, you'd better cut it out or you'll get spanked. <laughs> uh, how about we hit the hay? All right. You go ahead. I'll put the lights up. Hey, what's that? What? Well, well, there's a cab just stopped in front of the door. Uh-huh. Someone's getting out. Why, it, it looks like Amy Gibbs. Your cousin? What on earth is she doing here? The last I heard, she was living in Wisconsin. It's a funny time to make a call. Oh, she, she's coming up the walk, Joe. I'll let her in. Cousin Joe. Hello there, Amy. Uh, come in. Amy, darling. Oh, Cousin Nora. My goodness, it's nice to see you both. What are you doing so far away from home? Didn't you get my letter? Why, no, no, we didn't. Oh, dear, maybe I sent it to the wrong address. That's why you're so surprised to see me. I've come to New York to get a job. Really? I've been living all alone, you know, ever since Mother died. I decided that Wisconsin was a little too small for me, and New York would be so much more exciting. Well, you'll find it a lot more crowded, anyway. I found that out already, Cousin Joe. That's why I'm here. Well, I, I hope you won't think I'm intruding. Why not at all, Amy? But my train got in two hours ago, and would you believe it? I can't find a single hotel in a town that has a room for me. Oh, that's not unusual. The hotels are very crowded these days. I checked my bags at the station, and then I remembered about Cousin Joe and Cousin Nora and wondered if they'd mind putting up with poor little me for just one night. Why, of course not, Amy. Well, no, no, we, we've got an extra room upstairs. Oh, that's sweet of you both. I'm sure I can get a hotel room tomorrow, and I'll try not to get in the way. Well, you just forget about getting in our way, Amy. You're welcome here and you ought to know it. I'll fix the room up for you right away. I'm sorry I didn't bring my overnight bag. I haven't even got a toothbrush. Oh, I can give you a nightgown, anything else you need. Oh, no, I think I'd better go back to the station and get my overnight bag. Oh, have you got any small bills, Cousin Joe? My smallest is a 20 and I couldn't get back to the cab driver. Oh, let's see. Uh, Oh, we'll pour single suit? Oh, that's just perfect. And as long as I'm at it, I may as well bring all my luggage up here. You never know when things are misplaced in these public lockers. <laughs> sure. Oh, don't wait up for me now. Just leave the key under the mat. I'll be back in an hour or so. And thanks again, Cousin Nora. Thanks loads. Well, I... Uh, I'd better get her room ready. Nora? Yes, Jeff? Uh, nothing, no, nothing at all. Oh, good morning, Nora. Good morning, dear. Here's your coffee. Thanks. Oh, be careful. It's very hot. Uh, where's Amy? I thought I'd go downtown with her and help her find a place to stay. I'm afraid poor Amy isn't feeling very well. She isn't? I spoke to her up in a room a little while ago. She, she's had an attack of migraine or something. She asked me if she could stay another day or so until she got over it. Oh, well, if, if she's ill... I told her she could stay as long as she liked. You did? Well, I, I was 
<laughs> Being polite, Joe. I'm sure she'll be gone in a day or two as soon as she's well. I still wish you hadn't told her that. Well, why? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I just wish you hadn't. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be that way. It, it's just that I'm, I'm not used to having someone around. It, it's always been you and me and no one else. And I'm afraid I like it that way. How do you feel, Amy? Much better, Cousin Nora. I'll be out of bed very soon. You and Cousin Joe have both been so good to me. Oh, it's the least we could do. And don't think I'll ever forget it either. I never will. Well, I'll leave you now. I've got some work to do downstairs. All right, Cousin Nora. And I'll have my lunch in bed again today. Really, Cousin Nora, I've tried so hard to find a job. But I, I just can't seem to get one that suits me. And as far as apartments are concerned, they're impossible to get. Oh, and you wouldn't want poor little me to live in a furnished room, would you? It's so much nicer, yeah. I guess one of us should speak to her, Joe. Well, it's just kind of hard to ask her to leave. <sighs> but she makes no attempt to find a place of her own. Well, you know we can't afford to support her here indefinitely. She's borrowed over $100 from you already. Well, yes, that's right. Uh... And she hasn't even tried to find a job. Oh, I'd hate to ask her, but we have to. She's simply got to give us a definite date about leaving. Well, I'll, I'll talk to her myself, Nora. Uh, uh, tonight. Yes? Uh, it's Joe, Amy. Um, may I come in? I've just been fixing up my room. Isn't it pretty? Those curtains look familiar. I took them from your room, Cousin Joe. Oh, I didn't think that Cousin Nora would mind. They look so much nicer here. Uh, Amy, I want to talk to you. About what? Well, you've been here over a month now. Oh, has it been that long? My, how time flies. No, it isn't that. We, we, don't, we don't want to rush you, but... Uh, well, uh, Nora, Nora and I would like to know exactly how long you plan to stay. Oh, I'll be leaving soon. How soon? Cousin Joe, you almost sound as if you're anxious for me to go. Well, I... I, I uh... You really liked having me here. I know that. I can tell the way you look at me sometimes. What? I don't know what you mean. Your life has been so dull, Cousin Joe. So unexciting. And I brought something new into it. Oh, Amy, but I... Yesterday, while I was doing my hair in front of the mirror, my door was open. I saw you watching me. Well, I, I just glanced in. I've seen to... that look in a man's eyes before. Amy, this is crazy. You've watched me often, Cousin Joe. When I've walked up and down the stairs, when I've laughed. Sometimes I didn't even have to see you. I could feel your eyes. Amy, you, you've got to leave. I'm young, Joe. Young and pretty. Boys have told me lots of times how pretty I am. They say I do something to them. Do I do something to you, Joe? Amy. Put your arms around me. Please, Joe. Hold me in your arms. <sighs> Now, tell me to leave and I'll go. Joe? Darling Joe? Did you speak to her, Joe? Y yes, I, I talked to her. When is she leaving? Nora, I've been thinking it over. I mean, you see, it doesn't seem fair to... But Joe! Uh, let us stay a little longer, Nora. Give her a chance to get her bearings. Well, uh... Well, if you feel that way... It's all right with me. I... I suppose it can't do any harm. No, no, of course not. It can't do any harm at all. Amy, what are you doing with that dress on? It needs taking in, it seems. But, but that's my dress. It's the one I bought for Easter. Is it now? I didn't know. I just thought I'd borrow it. I'm so sick and tired of wearing the same old clothes. 
you had no right to go into my closet. But Cousin Laura... I was given permission. By whom? Cousin Joe. Joe? He said you wouldn't mind. Do you mind, Cousin Laura? Oh. No. No, I guess I don't mind. Here's my wash, Cousin Laura. Your, your wash? Please be careful what you do to the slips. They're silk, you know. Are you asking me? No, Cousin Nora, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. This house is a mess. Cousin Nora, if you can't handle the work yourself, you might at least get a maid. My room hasn't been straightened out all morning. Really, it's a disgrace. Amy. Yes? Would you please come out here for a moment? I'm doing my nails. Come in here if you want to speak to me. I've brought your suitcases up from the cellar. You have? What for? You're leaving, Amy. I'm what? You're leaving this house. Oh, don't be silly, Cousin Nora. I've stood for a great deal from you, Amy. I, I don't know why I have, but now I'm through. I can tell you why you stood for me, Cousin Nora. I'm not interested in what... You were afraid to force a showdown. Afraid? You've taken my orders like a servant, girl, because you didn't want to raise an issue. That's a lie. You know what's been going on around here. And you also know that if Joe had to make a choice, you might be out in the cold. The male animal has been on this earth for quite a while. It's taken him thousands of years to reach his present stage of civilization. But the wrong woman can send him back to the jungle and the caves in exactly half an hour. How dare you talk to me like that? Now, let's have no hysterics, Cousin Norma. I think I'm being very generous under the circumstances. Generous? I'm letting you stay here, aren't I? I could tell your husband to get rid of you if I wanted to. I could tell him to send you away, but I've got a big heart. I'm beginning to see that. You haven't got a chance against me, Nora, and you know it. How dare you? The arrangements we have is peculiar, I must admit, but I like it this way. Temporarily, at least. When a man meets another woman, he usually separates from his wife. In this case, I'm adding a little twist to it. I'm letting you stay. That's very kind of you. Of course, you have an alternative. Have I? You can pack your things and get out. Joe will give you a divorce. I'll see that he does. Well? I'll stay, Amy. I thought you would. There, my nails are finished. Lovely, aren't they? Here's your paper, Joe. Oh, thanks, Nora. Don't you want to read it? I haven't time. Uh, where's Amy? She hasn't come in yet. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Nora. Mr. Lewis is sending me to Chicago for a few days to introduce the new line. Oh. I should be home by Thursday. You don't mind, do you? Uh, Amy will be here to keep you company. Well, that must be Amy now. Is that you, Amy? Yes, Cousin Joe. No, we were worried about you. Oh, well, you, I'm sorry. The picture was a long one, and I did some shopping later. Well, uh, I'd better get packed. My train leaves in an hour. Are you going away, Joe? Uh, just for a few days, Amy. Business. I wish I didn't have to. Uh, well, I'd better get started. See you when I've packed. You're being very sensible, Cousin Nora. Am I? It's always best to accept things as they are. I know you and I'll get along while Cousin Joe is gone. Won't we, Nora? Oh, yes, Amy. We'll get along. Just fine. Go out and to dull to stay in. Laura, when did Joe say he'll be home? Thursday. And this is only Monday. Are you bored, Amy? Very. I intend to do my best to entertain you. <laughs> entertain me? What can you do for excitement, play checkers? You'll get your share of excitement, Amy. Be patient. Why are you looking at me like that? Was I looking at you in any particular way? 
just don't start any funny business, Cousin Noah. You'll regret it. How old are you, Amy? That's none of your affair. Mm, you can't be any more than 23 or 4. What about it? You have so much to look forward to in life. And there's so much you could miss. I often think of death, Amy. Sometimes when I fall asleep, I dream of it. And it comforts me. Stop talking like that. I don't like it. Oh, I... I think I'll go to bed. My head's been bothering me all day. If you're sick, why don't you call a doctor? I'm quite all right. It's just that I... I keep forgetting things and my... My head aches so. Good night, Amy. Good night. I hope your dreams are as pleasant as mine. Amy. Why are you down in the cellar? What's all that hammering about? I'm sorry if I disturbed you. What are you doing with those strips of wood? Just putting them together. Do you want to help? You'd better do your carpentry yourself. You're so much stronger than I am. What's this paper on the floor? Paper? Oh. Oh, it's a blueprint. You're making a washtub. Does it look like a washtub? Wooden washtubs aren't very practical, Cousin Nora. And anyway, by the shape of this diagram, it might easily turn out to be a... A what, Amy? It almost looks like a... Coffin. Yes, it does, doesn't it? What are you trying to pull around here? Is this a cheap trick to scare me? Answer me, do you hear? Answer me. Go to bed, Amy. Go to bed and get some rest. Amy, I've brought your dinner. Put the tray on that table and get out. Very well. Now leave me alone. Well, what are you standing there for? I want to know if you like the soup. It's very good. Here, let's... What did you just put in that soup? Oh, why, nothing. I saw you drop something in there. What are you trying to do? Poison me? You shouldn't have smashed that cup, Amy. Get out, Amy! Get out! Good night, Amy. I know what I'll do. I'll get the police. Night, Amy. No one. Why aren't you in bed? I'm not tired. Amy. Don't come here. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. Stay away from me. No I one. wish you wouldn't carry on in this way. What's that? Oh, it sounds like a police car. <laughs> what if the neighbors must have heard me? No, I'll put you where I'll never see you again. Amy. Come on. You see this bottle? I found it in your room. It's poison. You try to put it in my food. Oh, I'll be rid of you for good now. For good. Is this the Spencer house? Oh, officer, you're just in time. She tried to kill me. She tried to poison me. She's got out of her head. Are you Mrs. Spencer? I'm Mrs. Spencer, officer. I'm the woman who called you before. And uh, this is the girl I told you about. Oh. All right, girly. Come on. Let's you and me take a little walk. Oh, but there's nothing wrong with me. She's the one you want. Look, she tried to put this poison into my food. Do you deny that you put this in my food? Do you deny it? Of course, dear, I put it in. But I tried to tell you it was only saccharin. Saccharin? How long has this been going on? Ever since my husband left, officer. There's a wash tub downstairs she keeps referring to as a coffin. Oh, I've done my best to calm her. She's lying! Can't you see she's lying? Well, come on, girlie, we can talk it over downtown. Easy now. Let's not get rough, sister. Oh, just a moment, officer. Yeah? Uh, you see, 
this girl is my cousin, and I feel responsible for her. She's, she's not really insane. It's just that she's emotionally upset. I don't want to see her put away. Well, that's not up to me, lady. But if I talk to the proper authorities and testify that she's never really done anything wrong, do you think they might well, put her under my care? That all depends, lady. It's up to you. You'll go away for a nice long rest, won't you, Amy? And if I come down and talk on your behalf, you'll do as I say, won't you, Amy? Come on, girlie. Come on. Uh, Nora, I'm glad Amy's gone. You are, Joe? I, I was going to ask her to leave myself. Well, this way is better. You were going to ask her? You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> it doesn't matter now. Nora, there's something you ought to know. Don't you? No, I, I've been... Well, I've been kind of a fool, Nora. I, I don't know how to explain it. Then don't try. This trip is the first time I've been away from you in 12 years. I, I know it sounds kind of funny, but it gave me time to do a little thinking and then, and to understand how I'd miss you if you went away. Oh, Joe, let's forget it. Amy's gone and the rest doesn't matter. Uh, no, this, this chair feels comfortable. I couldn't find one as soft as this in the ho whole hotel. Nora, I don't deserve the break you're giving me, but I'll try to make up in some way. Here's your paper, Joe. I picked it up for you this evening. Thanks, Nora. Oh, it's ten o'clock. Yeah. Guess we'll hit the hay early tonight, huh? Uh, yeah. Looks like we'll have a nice day tomorrow. Mostly sunny, it says, with moderate west to southwest winds. Yes, life has a sameness about it, and it's something we all get used to and enjoy. In the last analysis, it's the dependable things that count the most. The 60 minutes you're sure of in each hour, the 24 hours in every day. You wouldn't want that changed, even if it were possible, would you? And I couldn't change it, if I tried. The clock will be heard again next week, same time. This program was written by Lawrence Clee, and Hart McGuire was heard as the clock. As Joe, Nora, and Amy were Charles Tingwell, Lynn Murphy, and Coralie Neville. The Clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset. Promise and fulfillment. Birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Do you like ghost stories? Do you like to feel the blood run down your spinal column like the mercury in a thermometer that's been plunged into ice-cold water? Throughout the ages, people have enjoyed listening to tales of the supernatural, although few believe the supernatural exists. I was one of those cynics myself until I heard about Kay and Larry Cowling. Now, I'm not so sure. The subject of time has a great deal to do with our preoccupation with ghosts. On one side of the fence, we have the realists. You live your own life on Earth and you don't return. On the other side, we have the romantics, the people who feel that the past is part of the present. The scoffers make fun of them. They demand proof when a ghost appears, and so far no one has been able to produce a genuine set of, shall we say, supernatural fingerprints. But tonight we'll leave the realists with their fingerprints and their hard-cold facts and lend an ear to a pair of likable young romantics. The story of Kay and Larry Cowling can undoubtedly be explained logically. But that depends, of course, on whether you have a logical turn of mind. Sleepy, darling? No, just relax. <laughs> too many cocktails before dinner, I guess. Where are we now? Well, not too far from New York. 
I don't think we ought to drive very late tonight, Larry. Especially after those drinks and that big dinner. You're liable to doze off at now, the I'm wheel. Now, I'm being very careful. I'd have stayed in New York if we could have gotten a hotel room. Now, we'll find some kind of a tourist place along the road. It's awfully woodsy around here, isn't it? Yeah, this whole section is pretty famous in the history books. Revolutionary War stuff. According to the guidebooks, George Washington must have gotten around an awful lot. <laughs> he seems to have slept in every house around here. Yeah, half the tourist places use that gag. To come on for gullible Middle Westerners, like us. Wasn't New York wonderful? Oh, boy. I wish we weren't going home so soon. Oh, we can come back sometime. Honeymoon can't last forever, sugar. Papa's got to go back and make a little dough. Oh, it's too bad we couldn't stay on longer, though. I was dying to buy a few antiques. Oh, listen, half that stuff is phony. You get hold of a rocking chair, kick it around till it looks like it's been through a war, then up the price and tell you Alexander Hamilton used it. Oh, you and your hard-headed realism. You've no romance. None at all? Well, I wouldn't go that far. Okay. <laughs> now, what you driving? Okay. Rain? Looks that way. Been threatening for half an hour. Now we'll have to find a place for the night. Uh-oh, here she comes. I'll close that window, honey. Oh, goodness, it's a cloudburst. Well, we won't drown, but I can't guarantee the car. I knew we should have kept on the main highway. This road will turn into a mud hole inside of five minutes. Are you sure you know where we are, darling? New Jersey, somewhere. Now, we'll stop at the first house and check our directions. Larry, look out! Phew. That was a close one. Well, now I don't know whether we can get out or not. No, I don't think so. Well, we're stuck, Kate. Here? Well, oh, darling, I didn't pick the spot. Well, we'll try it again. No, it's no use. We're stuck fast. <sighs> now what? Well, we stay here until the rain stops. But it's getting so dark, Larry. Would you prefer to walk? In this rain. Wait a minute. What's that shining through the woods? It looks like a house light. Well, it doesn't seem bright enough for that. Oh, well, we may as well take a chance. Come on, honey. We'll make a run for it. Ready? Uh-huh. Let's go. That's a house, all right. I can see it now through the trees. Just look at it, Larry. A real colonial mansion. Oh, it's a little too wet to admire the architecture. Hurry, come on. I'm going as fast as I oh, can. It's coming down like crazy. Hey, get under this tree, Kay. Okay? Mail it up in a minute or so. If we try to cross that clearing, we'll get soaked. Right. Did you see the house again when that lightning flashed? Yeah, all shutters and white shingles. There's some kind of a lamp burning over the door. Ah, looks like candlelight from here. The place seems so quiet. Well, there must be someone there if the lights are on. We can't stand here all night, darling. The rain's getting at us even through the trees. Here, pull your coat over your head. Oh, Larry, my head, it fell off. Oh, where is it? I can't see it. Wait a minute. Oh, never mind. The hat's ruined anyhow. Come on, let's make a dash for that porch. Come on. Ah, here we are. What's that sign say over the door there, Kay? Ye oldie sunny side in. <laughs> sunny side is right. <laughs> well, it must be a hotel, Larry. Isn't that a break? Well, I hope they got a room for us. Where's the doorbell? Well, there isn't any. Oh, here's a knocker over here. Oh, I can see it's going to be one of those quaint little joints. Larry. What? Look over there. Why, they're horses. With saddles on them. They're hitched to those posts. Yeah, I've, I've never seen saddles like that before. Oh, good evening. What do you want? Well, uh, a room if you have one. We're not taking strangers in tonight. You run a hotel, don't you? Find another spot to tether your horses. Tonight the place is closed. Bring them in, Bess. There's no fit night for a dog. But said... You as a sea woman. Come in. Well, thanks. Go in and tend to your guests. The throats are parched and they're calling for you. All right, all right. Where are you from, Sir? Uh, La Porte. La Porte? In France? No, uh, Indiana. Indiana? What in the name of Satan is Indiana? Why, it's... 
You don't know where Indiana is? <laughs> Say, what kind of a gag is this? Gag? Yeah, what's the idea of that get-up? You speak the King's English, and yet your language is foreign. So is your dress. Well, no matter. You're here for the night. Set yourself at that table, and I'll see you about your lodgings. Larry, isn't he queer? <laughs> you got a load of that outfit? Knee breeches and a wig. And the old lady, <laughs> she was wearing a costume. Well, he'd certainly do it up brown in here. Well, what do you mean? Well, this atmosphere, it, it's like a masquerade. You think they're just putting on an act? <laughs> well, of course, Kate. I'll bet the tourists eat it up. But why was she so rude to us? They didn't sound as if they were very anxious to have guests. All part of the background. I think it was kind of cute if we weren't so wet. Larry. Yeah? Look at this room. Well, what about it? Just a bunch of antiques. But these antiques are new. So what? And look at the candles along the walls. They don't have electric lights either. Oh, part of routine, that's all. I'm not so sure. You're not so sure of what? There's something about this place. It, it frightens oh, now, me. Oh, now, look, don't be silly, honey. But look at the guns leaning against the fireplace. Old-fashioned muskets. Decorations, probably. If they're decorations, why aren't they hanging on the wall? Why are they so shiny and no? Search me. Oh, Larry, let's get out of now, here. Now, honey, it's raining cats and dogs. As long as we've got a place to stay, let's keep it. We may not be able to find another, and that car won't budge. The old woman's coming back again, Larry. I brought you two tankards of ale. It'll warm your bones a bit. Ale? Well, sounds okay. I'd rather have a martini, but ale will do. Martini? Dry. Is this martini, fish, or fowl? Uh, a martini is a drink, lady. Well, thanks for the ale. <sighs> Boy, this stuff is good. The Hoskins house is noted for its brew. <coughs> oh. Oh, it's awfully strong. Oh, oh no. Open up. Your Excellency. Has he arrived? Not yet, Your Excellency. Larry, he's dressed like the others. Pray be seated, Your Excellency. I'll tell my husband you're here. Who are these two? Travelers, Your Excellency. We gave them shelter from the rain. I told you to take in no guests. It was Hoskins. Never who... mind. I went to prepare my quarters. In all haste, Your Excellency. Uh, a pretty rough night, isn't it? I don't know you. Oh, my name's Cowling. Uh, this is my wife. Uh, how do you do? Good evening. And uh, your name? You don't know who I am? I don't believe we've ever met. <laughs> met? <laughs> well, really... What's he laughing at? I don't know. But the man is rather rude. What was that you said? You heard me. Larry, please don't start anything. Yes. Tell your husband to hold his tongue. If he displeases me, I may have to cut it off. Why, well, I'll kick your teeth Larry! In. What am I supposed to do, stand for his lips? He's got a pistol in his hand. Well, hey. <laughs> you needn't fail. I'm not wasting this bullet on such as you. I'm saving it. For a friend. I've never seen a pistol like that before. It looks like a museum piece. Your remarks are as stupid as your countenance. Keep them to yourself. Oh, this museum piece may make some conversation of its own. Your Excellency, your quarters are ready. Good. I'm to be called one hour before the dawn. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. What kind of a joint is this, anyway? Larry, I'm afraid. Of what? These clowns? They're getting a little tired of the act, that's all. But, Larry, maybe they're not putting on an act. What? Well, suppose... Suppose they're insane. What? The, the whole silly lot of them? Why do they call the tall one your excellency? And the way they bow and scrape and talk? Larry, this isn't a musical comedy. There's something wrong. Well, you... You don't think we've accidentally stumbled into a nut house, do you? Whatever it is, Larry, I don't like it and I want to leave. Where's your handbag? Over here. Come on, let's get out. Hey, I can't open the door. There's a heavy bolt on it. Wait a minute, maybe I can pry it loose with the... Stand where you are, sir. Larry, he's pointing a shotgun hey, at Hey, what's the idea? Are you trying to leave? Well, uh, we, uh, we thought if well, we'd see if we could get our car out of the ditch. Car? And... Our automobile. Your language is the devil's own. And so are your garments. Stand away from the door. Stand back, I say. Larry. It's all right, honey. Take it easy. What's the idea of the artillery? Uh, there's a holdup? You're staying for the night. No one leaves here until the dawn. 
Don't show your back again, Sarah, unless you'd like both barrels between your shoulder blades. Your ale, Seth. Good. We'll drink to his excellency. I don't think I want any more ale. It's much too strong for me. We'll drink to his excellency. Do I make myself clear? Uh, better humor him along, honey. Wait for an opening. To his excellency. Uh, to his excellency. Oh, oh boy, this stuff is dynamite. A toast now to Tom, a wise president and a just one. Tom? President of what? Our country, you fool. Oh, but his name isn't Tom. Is your woman being disrespectful, sir? Oh, but I... I... Wait, 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 wait. Oh, all right, Mr. Hoskins, uh, we'll make a toast. To the President of the United States. The Right Honorable Thomas Jefferson. But Larry, Jefferson was president in 1804. One hundred and fifty years and more is a long, long time. And since the year of our Lord, 1804, many men have gone to their just reward. How many of these have returned, even for a short space of time, is a question that might be answered by the romantics. And only a realist will insist that none have returned at all. Your room is here. You will remain inside for the night. When the sun rises, you will be permitted to leave. You keeping us prisoner here? It were best for you, young man, to mind your tongue and shut your eyes until you leave. The affairs of this house tonight do not concern you. Larry, don't argue with her. Remember, Hoskins will use his musket if you so much as raise your voice. And when the dawn appears, keep well within this room. Your lives may depend on it. Good evening to ye. Sleep well. She's locking us in, Larry. Yeah. Let's see where the window leads to. No. Too much of a drop. We'd be taking a chance if we tried to climb down. What do we do, Larry? I don't know what those screwballs are up to, but maybe I can think of a way to get out of here before morning. You know, I'm beginning to change my mind. About what? I'm not so sure they are crazy. You're not? That ale had a stronger effect on you than I thought. The things they say are odd, but there's one way they might make sense. Oh, how? If those people were living in colonial... But they're not. They're living now. This is the 20th century. I'll bet my last five bucks we've just met a bunch of refugees from a padded cell. Say, what did you mean if they were living in colonial times? I don't know what I meant. I'm so confused I can't think straight. Well, why don't you try to get some rest, honey? What are you going to do? I'll figure a way out of here. Maybe we'd better not try. No, they don't worry me. It isn't that. No? Well, somehow I want to find out what she meant when she told us to keep well inside the room at dawn. Say, so what's got into you? Larry, I have a feeling we're living something that we'll never be able to explain to anyone. Well, I only wish you'd explain it to me. Oh, you'd only laugh. No, I wouldn't. Come on, what is it, Kate? Tell me. Do you believe in the supernatural? Well, you mean ghosts and things like that? Oh, not exactly. Well, then what? Well, these people, Larry, they, they exist... Well, I mean, we see them, we talk to them, and yet I don't think they're alive. Oh, hey, now, take it easy. You need some rest, honey. I knew you wouldn't understand. Why should you? I don't understand myself. They're nuts. That's what they are, crackpots. And when we get out of here, I'm making a full report to the local cops. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, come on, lie down over here, baby. Aren't you going to try to get some sleep yourself? No, I, I've got some heavy thinking to do between now and morning. <laughs> Preparing to get us out. I don't know why I didn't think of this before. I'm going to tear these sheets into strips to make a rope. I'll lower you from the window first, then follow you. Well, suppose I see us, Larry. I won't have to take a chance. The dawn's coming up. It stopped raining. Yeah. The trees look so unreal. It's it's like a dream, Larry. The whole thing is like a dream. Then it's time we woke up. 
Okay, baby, come over here to the window. Are you scared? Just a little. You'll be all right. Here, help him with... Oh, what a rotten break. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, look at that clearing down there. Larry! Yeah, six of them. They'd spot us in a minute if we try to get out. What are they doing? Oh, looks like they're holding some kind of a meeting. Oh, wait. Hey! Larry, it's a Jew. Oh, holy smoke. Those men over there are doctors. Look at the instruments on the table. Oh, the two in the middle must be seconds. And the guy in the white shirts with the pistol. One of them is a the man we met downstairs. The one they call Excellency. Yeah. Where have I seen the other one before? I've seen him too, Larry. Or at least I've seen his picture. They're back to back now. Now I know why they let us in here and kept us prisoner. They'll kill each other, Larry. Oh, steady, Kay. Steady. Ladies and gentlemen. One, two... Three, four... Larry! The one on the right just shot into the sky. He did it deliberately, Kay. But, but the other one... Well, look at him. Well, look at the coward. He's taking aim, Kay. He's... Wait. <laughs> well, I hope you're enjoying our excursion into the supernatural. But I'm afraid Larry and Kay aren't. Somebody's coming in. I'm going to take a sock at him. It's our only chance. Oh, no, Larry, don't. They'll kill us if you do. Easy now. You saw the duel? Duel? Now, nah, don't make me laugh. That was murder. You're wanted downstairs in the tap room. Come with me. And mind you don't try any tricks. I'm going to watch for an opening, Kay. When it comes, get ready to run. He's carrying someone in. That's yes, the guy who was shot. Well, look at his shirt front, Larry. It's covered with blood. He hasn't got a chance. He'll be dead inside of an hour. Put him in the corner room. Surgeon right. will probe for the bullet. Here are the strangers, sir. I'll take care of them. You stay with him. Well, you witnessed the duel? Oh, yes. Uh, we witnessed the duel. Come into the tap room. Huh? Where's the hero? Where's His Excellency? He did a very fancy job. Be quiet. He's got a wonderful sense of fair play. What do they call him besides Your Excellency? The butcher? I said be quiet. Oh, Larry. I won't be quiet. This man is a murderer. He ought to be jailed. Were you referring to me? You're darn tootin' I was referring to you. Your opponent deliberately fired into the air, and then you killed him in cold blood. Your language is offensive, sir. Well, that's too bad. I demand an immediate apology. How would you like a punch in the jaw instead? Larry, please. I see you still don't know who I am. You young fool, he's one of the best shots in the country. I have just got rid of a major nuisance in my life. Now I shall be forced to wipe out a minor one. You will give me satisfaction on the green tomorrow, sir. No. And meanwhile, you'll take my glove in your face. <laughs> I work without gloves, brother. Like this. <laughs> Thanks for your hospitality. Come on, Kay, let's get out of here fast. It's the next turn, officer. About half a mile down. We'll reach our car in just a minute. That story of yours isn't straight, mister. You're spending a night in the cooler. I tell you, it happened just as I described it to you. They were all dressed in those funny clothes. And we saw the duel. Yeah, and one of them was killed. No question about it. He was hit in the heart. He didn't have a chance. Well, Larry, there's the car. You see, officer? See, it's still stuck in the road. Oh, where's the house? On the left, about 300 yards up behind the trees. Well, wasn't it on the right, Larry? No, 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 the left. Will you make up your minds? Oh, okay, but this way. Come with me. You know, I thought I knew every inch of this country. And what kind of a house was it? Well, colonial. Looked brand new. It was just being freshly painted. Well, there was a porch and a garden in the back. Hey, what's them branches? They're sharp. Well, that's funny. It wasn't as wild as this last night. We didn't have to go through all this underbrush to reach the house. There was a path here. Yeah, and it was clear behind those trees. You sure we're going right? Well, maybe we're... Oh, Larry, look, my hat. I lost it last night, remember? Oh, sure, yeah, look, there it is. But we, we probably came... Well, Larry! Is that the house you're talking about? Why, it, it couldn't be. Oh, let's go up. That house is old, officer. The weeds are growing right up to the door. Yeah. Freshly painted, huh? This dump ain't had a paintbrush on it for a hundred years. Oh, just look at the inside. It's falling apart. Well, we must have made a mistake. Larry, I... look at it closely. 
It could be the same house if it were new. You know, I got a half a mind to yank you Look, in. I tell you, officer, we weren't trying to kid you. I swear we weren't. Did you have any drinks last night? Just one or two. No, one or two, huh? You must have been plastered, that's what. This shack's been standing here ever since the Revolution, and nobody's lived in it for 90 years. But I... I just can't believe that. Here you are, wise guy. You answer this ticket in the county court tomorrow. I ain't sure what the charge is going to be yet, but I'll figure out one by the time you show up. School balls. What does it mean, Kate? I don't know. Could we have dreamed it? Oh, you know we didn't. Well, maybe we didn't find the right house. M- maybe it's off in the woods over there. Larry, no. Huh? Let's not look for it any longer. Oh, you're right. Better leave well enough alone. Well, we may as well start back to town. I'll get a tow truck to pick up the car. Oh, which reminds me, I hope I got enough cash on me. Let's see. 20, 40, 50. Kate. Well, what is it, Larry? You remember the guy who was shot in the duel? Yeah. He said he looked familiar. Oh, take a look at the face on this $10 bill. It's the same man, Larry. Alexander Hamilton. The glove. The one the other man hit you with. There it is on the floor. Say, that's right. It's a gauntlet. And look how old it is. It was new when... Larry. The initials on the wrist. A, B. A, B. If the other man was Alexander Hamilton, those initials must stand for... Aaron Burr. The man who actually did kill Hamilton way back in 1804. Well, there you are. I give you the story with no apologies and no explanations. The explanations will occur in your minds of their own accord, depending on what side of that fence you're on. A realist might say, for instance, that the Cowlings were rather flighty people, given to rather potent liquids and periodic hallucinations. But then the romantics might retort, where is the proof that it didn't happen? As for me, I take no sides. I've been around long enough to know that sooner or later the facts will out. It's only a matter of time. The clock will be heard again next week, same time. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and Hart McGuire was the clock. Also heard were Leon Pierce as Larry, Wynne Nelson as Kay, together with Fifi Banvard, Tom Farley, Owen Weingott, and Ken Warren. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. defines the word tourist as one who makes a tour, a traveler, someone who goes from place to place learning new ways of life and seeing new things. To many of us, the word has a romantic quality, and we envy the lucky globetrotter, just as Liz and Henry Briggs envy the travelers who pass the little tourist house and gas station they own just off the big state highway on the rim of Death Valley. It's the location, Henry. Now, why should people stop overnight at a place like this? They're on their way to Hollywood, maybe, or New York. They don't have time. I know, Liz, I know. You told me before. But you seem to forget that a man behind the wheel has got to get some rest. Not here, though. Not in this forsaken spot. And I don't blame them. Mm. I bet it must be nice to travel. Europe, Africa, India. Can you imagine seeing the Taj Mahal in the moonlight? What have we got for supper? (laughs) Supper. That's all you ever think about. Your stomach. Aren't you even interested in anything else? Right now? No. Someone's pulling up outside. I like the pumps. Station's closed. You're not stopping in front of the pumps, Henry. You stopped by the door. Say, maybe you want to spend the night. Look at that car, Henry. Isn't it handsome? Hmm. You sure must be going places. Look at the size of that trunk he's got strapped to the back. We better go out and see what he wants. All right. Evening. Evening. I saw your sign. I was... 
Wondering if you had any room. Oh, we've got plenty of rooms. Three dollars a night, single. Uh, six with meals. Oh, that sounds fine. We are all parked at car. <laughs> oh, it's it's all right where it is. My luggage is in the back. Well, how about that trunk? Uh, you want to leave it there, I guess, if you're only staying for the night. Oh, I may stay longer, so I'll take it upstairs with me. My name's Hewlett. Jason Hewlett. And mine's Briggs. And this here's the message. How do you do? Well, glad to know you. That's quite a trunk you've got there, Mr. Hewlett. I never saw so many labels. Goodness, look at this, Henry. Paris, London, Cairo, Compton. Hey, stay away from that, please. What? I... I don't like anyone going near my things. I was just looking at the labels, Mr. Hewlett. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. I, that was rude of me. Uh, yeah, yes, that trunk has been around quite a bit. It's... Had its share of experience. <laughs> it looks kind of heavy, mister. I'd better help you unstrap and carry it upstairs. Uh, you'll, you'll be very careful. Why, sure. All right, we'll carry it up together. Oh, first, here's three days' rent in advance. Uh -huh. I'll want a quiet room on the top floor, if possible. And I want all my meals served there. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of irregular. I'll pay you extra for it. Is it okay with you, Liz? Sure, it'll be a pleasure to put ourselves out a little for a traveling man like Mr. Hewlett. And he might even tell us all about the places he's been to and the things he's seen and done if he gets a little time. <laughs> you never can tell, Mrs. Briggs. I might. Oh, what a load that trunk was. You must have bricks inside. Gold bricks, maybe, the way he kept telling me to be careful. Did he like his room, Henry? No, sure, he's not hard to please. Seems to have plenty of money, too, the way he handed it out. Did you ask him about his business? What he does? Now, listen, Liz, that's his business, not ours. You got a bad habit of being too curious. Man's got a right to some privacy. Oh, well, my goodness, it can't do any harm to ask him what kind of work he does. Mm. Maybe he's a government agent or something. All those labels on his luggage. Your trouble, you go to too many of those spy pictures, government agent. <laughs> My guess is this guy's a salesman. He's got that trunk full of samples. Yeah, there he comes. Now, don't ask him any questions. Hello. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Hewlett. Uh, would you mind having dinner downstairs with us just for tonight? It's all prepared, and if I take the time to bring it up, it might get cold. Well... Well, all right. Just for tonight. I'll sit down. Make yourself comfortable. I'll have the soup on in a jiffy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's nice to have you with us, Mr. Hewlett. Oh, thanks. Uh, how far is the nearest town? Oh, about 11 miles east. Uh, Death Valley's west. 11 miles, eh? Is it a large town? Large enough. This goes in every Monday to do her shopping for the week. The town's called Warren City. I... I thought I might do a little business there. Oh, what kind of business? Liz, be careful uh, of that suit. It's a nice place you have here. Oh, it could be nicer. I'd be wanting to do some redecorating, but Henry says it's too expensive. <laughs> I like the place the way it is. Henry's not a man for novelties. I remember how I had to beg him to buy a radio oh, years ago. <laughs> he said it was only a newfangled toy that wouldn't last. <laughs> you, uh... You own a radio? Oh, yeah, a good one, too. We, we usually listen to news about this time. Uh, say, Liz, will you turn it on? I, I wish you wouldn't turn it on right now. No? I I, I have a slight headache. It's too much driving. The, the radio wouldn't help it any. Hmm. All right, Mr. Hewlett. You're the guest. And pass salt, Liz. Rolls, Mr. Hewlett. Oh, thanks. Nice and fresh, too. There's a truck that delivers them every morning, along with the papers. The, the newspapers? Mm hmm. Warren City Gazette. Mm -hmm. Pass about the list. You're rather secluded out here, I imagine. It must get lonesome. Oh, I don't know. Oh, it does, Henry, and you know oh. it. Our nearest neighbor's a mile away, Mr. Hewlett, and there's never much excitement. I guess a man like you would find it boring, Mr. Hewlett. A man... Like me? I mean, a man who's traveled as much as you have. Oh, I, I, uh, I uh, suppose your business must be pretty important to make you get around as much as you do. Mr. Hewlett's business is none of ours, Liz. I was just saying. My business is books, Mrs. Briggs. Oh, books. 
You sound disappointed. Well, I... I just didn't think it was anything like that. No? <laughs> then what did you think it was? Liz, please. Oh, now, don't be so narrow-minded, Henry. The gentleman wants to talk. Oh, it's quite all right, Mr. Briggs. I don't mind. Now, tell me, what business did you think I was in? Oh, some kind of a traveling line. Uh, exotic perfume or, or silks from China. Spices and rare jewels. Oh, now you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a walking geography book. All she ever does is look at maps. <laughs> well, travel is educational. And in a way, you know, my business is rare, so to speak. You see, I collect very rare volumes in every language. You don't say. I travel from country to country, trading and buying and, well, seeing the world. Have you ever been to Persia? Once or twice. Oh. I picked up a very expensive edition there that belonged to a sultan many years ago. A sultan? The book was bound in woven gold, and there were rubies on the covers. That must have cost a lot of money. <laughs> is, is that why he's so careful about that trunk? No, I... Well, that is not exactly. I, I sold that particular volume to an English millionaire. The trunk is another matter. <laughs> not really interesting enough to discuss. I, uh, I think I've had enough to eat. But you've only finished your soup. Oh, I'm not very hungry. I, I had something just before I came here. Well, if you want me to, I'll bring a sandwich up for you later on, Mr. Hewitt. Oh, never mind. That, that won't be necessary. Oh, I noticed some matches inside on one of the tables. May I borrow them? Hmm. Sure. Help yourself. Thanks. And, uh, good night. Good night. Good night, Mr. Hewlett. It's funny, uh, you got awful touchy. Especially when we mentioned that trunk. Hmm. Ah, well, all counting for dispositions. Henry? I wonder what's in there. In where? His trunk. He never told us. Why should he tell us? It's none of our affairs. Well, I was just curious. Oh, that's the trouble with you, Liz. One of these days you're going to regret that curiosity of yours. Oh, don't be silly. Yeah, well, as long as he's gone, we may as well hear the news. I put the radio on good and loud so we can listen while we... Hey, Liz, come in here a minute. What's the matter? Radio's broken. A radio's broken? Look. You see? Valves won't light up. Oh, well, that's funny. I was using it only two hours ago and worked fine then. You did? Well, what could have happened to it, Henry? Hmm. Well, maybe the, uh, the light cord's out of the socket. No. Cord's okay. Henry, look. Say. All the wires inside are broken. Why? They look as if they've been pulled out deliberately, Liz. Liz, are you sure you weren't careless about using this machine? Oh, you think I'm silly enough to yank out all those wires? Well, then how did they come loose? I don't know. Has anybody been inside the house today? No. Are you sure? Well, stop asking me so many foolish questions. Well, I'll take this into town at the end of the week. It'll take quite a while before it's fixed. You know how rushed they are these days. Now we won't be able to hear the news. Henry. Ah. There was someone inside the house besides me. Who? And he was in this living room. You mean Mr. Hewlett? Yes. But why would he want to go around ruining people's radio sets? I don't know if he did it. It just seems peculiar. But he was here, Henry, alone. Just before he went upstairs. Yeah. Coming to get those matches. Do you think he did it? Oh, I don't know. Why don't you ask I him? I can't do that. Not without proof. Well, if I were you, I would, Henry. But he's some kind of practical joker. Well, if he is, that... This isn't so funny. Well, if you won't ask him, I will. In the morning. And Henry... Well... I'm also going to ask him point blank just what he's got inside that trunk. Q. 
Curiosity is a very peculiar thing. Once instilled in the mind, it grows stronger with the passage of time, and every hour only serves to feed its insatiable appetite. And people who finally give in to its gnawing pain have forgotten too soon what curiosity did to the proverbial cat. Is he up yet, Henry? I don't know, Liz. I didn't hear him move around. No, I've got his breakfast ready. I'm going to take it up to his room. Oh, Liz, uh, uh, maybe you'd better not ask him anything. Oh, uh, why not? He broke our radio, didn't he? But we're not sure. Then who else did it? Well, if you ask me, you can... if you do ask him, be polite about it. Uh, it was maybe just an accident. Oh, all right, Henry. <laughs> What did you do with the newspaper? Newspaper? I didn't take it. Well, I found the bread outside. The paper was missing. What do you think they forgot to deliver it? They haven't forgotten in three years, Liz. Henry, there's something queer going on in this house, and I'm getting worried. Now, don't let your imagination go haywire. It's not my imagination, and you know it. First the radio, now the newspapers, and that trunk. What on earth could he have in that trunk? Now, Liz. I'm going up to his room right now with his breakfast, and I'm going to find out what this is all about. Once and for all. Well, what is it? I've got your breakfast, Mr. Hewlett. I'll leave it outside the door. I'll pick it up later. But uh, I want to see you. What do you want, Mrs. Briggs? Uh, here's your breakfast, eggs and bacon, rolls and coffee, orange juice, too. Now put it on the table. Now, what did you want to see me about? I, uh, I was wondering if you tried to use our radio last night. Your radio? Yes, you see, it's not working right now. I don't know anything about your radio. Well, I, I just thought I'd ask. Uh, have you seen this morning's paper? No. Uh, neither have we. It didn't come today. First time in three years. Mrs. Briggs, I'm very busy. You'll excuse me, won't you? Oh, why, of course. I didn't mean to disturb you. I'll come back for those breakfast dishes in about an hour. Uh, no, I'll bring them down myself. What are you staring at? Those padlocks on the trunk. There are three of them. Good, Good morning, Mrs. Briggs. Uh... Good morning. frightens me, Henry. The way he looked at me when I mentioned the padlocks. Well, he was mad because you didn't mind your own affairs, and he was right. Nevertheless, you're not leaving me alone in this house with that man, Henry. For the love of Mike, you're acting like a frightened kid. You'd think he was some kind of a murderer. Henry! What brought that into your mind? Liz, will you cut it out? It's a sign, that's what it is. You're thinking of that as a warning. Look, you need some air, and you've got your shopping to do today. Take the car and drive into town. By the time you get back, well, maybe you'll see how silly you've been. Oh, all right, I'll go and do my shopping. But tonight we're giving him notice. He's got to get out of this house by tomorrow. And he can take that awful trunk along with him. Padlocks, labels and all. Mrs. Briggs. Good morning, Freddie. In town for the weekly shopping. Yeah, that's right. I got my list all ready. Fine, just read it off. Uh, four cans of tomato juice, three cans of peas, a box of sugar. Pretty weird story, wasn't it, in the Gazette this morning? Uh, I didn't get to read the papers today. The whole town's talking about the murder, I guess. What? What? What story in the Gazette? It concerned a murder? Well, the cops aren't sure. The body hadn't been found yet, but the girl's missing. No doubt about that. Where did all this take place? Lawrenceville. That's about a hundred miles from here. A hotel waitress disappeared from her room. But oh, why do they think it was murder? Well, they don't rightly know, I guess. The police just put together the facts and figured that something pretty awful had happened to her. They're still looking for the body. Her room was a mess when they broke in. Do they know who might have done it? One of the guests, maybe. Trouble is, there was a convention going on and the hotel was full up. So many people checked out at once. But in a hotel, how could the... The body disappeared. Well, the police aren't talking. First of all, they haven't even proved there is a body. But if there was... Yes? They figure it might have been taken out of the place in a trunk. Well, that was one of my better class moments. One that Mrs. Briggs will always remember. Henry, 
Henry, listen. What's the matter? There was a story in the papers today. The whole town's talking about it. A girl was murdered, they think. What? In Lawrenceville. And the police believe her body was taken away in a trunk. Oh, now, oh, Liz. Henry, don't stand there and disagree with me. Why does he keep it out? Why is he so mysterious about everything? We've got to do something. Jason Hewlett may be a dangerous killer. Now, you can't go around calling people killers just because they own trunks, Liz. Henry, if you don't do something, I will. <laughs> What do you want me to do? Call the police. Uh, I tell you, that newspaper story could have fitted in with Jason Hewlett. The man there after was heading west. He left Lawrenceville yesterday afternoon. Do they know what he looks like? No, but they did mention something about a car. <laughs> Just open the door upstairs. Mrs. Briggs. Yes, Mr. Hewlett? You needn't bring me my dinner this evening. I don't want to be disturbed at all. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Hewlett. <laughs> Henry, look. Why would he break the radio and steal the paper? So we wouldn't hear the news or read it, don't you see? He didn't want us to know what's going on. Oh. Henry, you've got to call a state trooper and get him to open that trunk. All right, Liz, I'll do it now. Is this his room? Yes, officer. The trunk's in there, too. A big trunk, big enough to hide a body. What is it? Open up, mister. State police. Well, what's the trouble? Your name Hewlett? Yeah. When were you in Lawrenceville last? Lawrenceville? Well, I've never been there. There's the trunk I told you about, officer. Let's have a look at it. Uh, now, just a moment. That trunk happens to belong to me. It's private property. I know it. Let's has... have the keys to those padlocks, mister. Do you have a search warrant? Right here. I tell you, there's nothing inside that trunk except some rare editions of books I've purchased. That's why I've kept it locked. Just to make sure, let's take a look. The keys, mister. All right. Here. I'll see you in court for this. All of you. You can't treat me like a common criminal and get away with it. And as for you, Mrs. Keep Blake, away from me. Move back now. Give me room to open this lid. What? Inside, officer? Books. <laughs> Books. Well, are you satisfied? Oh, I'm afraid I made a mistake. I'll say you made a mistake. Sorry, Mr. Hewlett, but you know how it is. Some women just can't keep their noses out of things that don't concern them. Now get out of here, all of you, and leave me alone. Well, Liz, you got any more bright ideas about trunk murders? <laughs> Better look under the bed tonight. Maybe a full-grown gorilla prowling around the house. Oh, I've never been so embarrassed in my life. I've been <laughs> such a fool. Ed, do I still have to stay home and hold your hand? Oh, stop talking like that, Henry. <laughs> I feel awful enough as it is. I'm going to town to bowl and, for Pete's sake, apologize to Mr. Hewlett for he sues us. You understand? Yes, Henry. I'll do it now. Who is it? Ah. Uh, I just want to see you for a second, Mr. Hewlett. I, I wanted to tell you Keep how sorry. I wanted to apologize, Mr. Hewlett, that's all. All right, you apologize. Now get out. You don't know how stupid I feel. Just before my husband left the house, he told me to come up here. That trunk. Well? Were you packing to leave? What is that? No. Oh, no. You prying female. You asked for it. Now you're going to see it. No, 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 please. Let go of me. You're very sharp-eyed, aren't you? You notice things immediately. You've got a false bottom in that trunk. Well, look at what it's been concealing. Go on, satisfy your curiosity. Look at it. She's dead. You're quite right. She's dead, and I strangled her. Would you like the details? Just stay where you are, Mrs. Briggs. I believe you mentioned that your husband's gone. Well, that seems to fit into our plans, doesn't it? Don't, don't hurt me, please. Do you like tours, Mrs. Briggs? Tours around the world? The labels on that trunk are interesting, aren't they? I won't tell if you leave me alone. You're going to get your wish, Mrs. Briggs. Yes. You're going to travel. You're going to make a journey with my other friend. Inside that trunk. No! There'll be plenty of room, Mrs. Briggs, for both of you. And if you're slightly cramped, it won't matter very much. 
You won't be aware of it, you see. You're choking me. Oh, it feels good to have my hands around your throat, Mrs. Briggs. I've been looking forward to it. Oh, no, please. Let her go, you swine. Let go of her. Let go of her. I'm flying out of you. You all right now, Liz? I think so. Is he dead? No. No, but he, he won't make any more trouble until the cops get here. Oh, thank heaven you came back. I, I didn't have the car keys. You took them this morning when you drove to town. Now, you, you, you take it easy, Liz. I'll, I'll call the police. Henry. Yeah? Just one thing, Henry. When they take the trunk away... Well? Do you think we can keep the labels? Yes, the urge to travel is strong in all of us, and time takes on a new and exciting quality when we hit the broad white highway that ribbons out from coast to coast. And if by any chance you happen to take that trip this summer and your route carries you east or west, you might stop off at a little gas station on the rim of Death Valley and say hello to Liz and Henry Briggs. I suggest one precaution, however. Don't exhibit any trunks with labels. The clock will be heard again next week, same time. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and Hart McGuire was the voice of the clock. As Liz Briggs, you heard Margaret Christensen. As Henry Briggs, Don Crosby. And as Jason Hewlett, Lynn Bullen with Jerry Wells as the officer. The Clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production.